welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us on July 29th at six o'clock. All right, so are there any adjustments to the agenda? Yes, we, we have two executive sessions on student matters. There'll be two. Okay, and it's okay to move those to the end of the meeting? Yep. Okay. Any other changes to the agenda? All right. Um, assigning times and a timekeeper, we haven't always done that. Does anyone feel strongly whether that needs to happen or not? Okay. I'm comfortable moving forward without doing that. I think usually we can get through things um, in a reasonable amount of time. Any objections to that? Okay. All Sounds right. Um, what's that, Lisa? Oh, I just said that sounds good to me. Okay, thank you. All right, this is our first public comment. Um, would anyone like to share? Okay. Just gonna give one more minute for people to unmute if they need to. They know we do have some public with us. All right, I guess not right now. We do have another public comment toward the end of the meeting. Um, so we have a consent agenda and that involves approving the minutes of Tuesday, June 16th. Um, so has everyone had an opportunity to review those minutes? Anyone have thoughts on the minutes from June 16th? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from June 16th. Okay. Andrew, thank you. And do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. All in, po all, all in <laughs> favor <laughs> of approving the minutes from June 16th, please say aye. Aye. Hi. Okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Minutes are unanimously approved. Okay. Um, and now we come to board comment. Um, does any of the board members have comments at this point in time? All right, um, so we'll move forward to the superintendent's report. Uh, so you guys received my superintendent's report last week. Um, there's other stuff that we're gonna hit on tonight that are discussion items. Um, so I don't have anything else to add, um, but I'll entertain any questions folks have. And certainly I know something that's on everyone's mind is our plans around COVID-19. And I'll give you an update on all those too tonight. All right, so any questions from last week's superintendent's report? If not, right. we had the so admin retreat went really well over the last two days, and I thought it was it was very positive. Uh, we were able to get draft goals that we come into the SU board for adoption in August uh, for continuous improvement plan goals and strategic plan goals, and um, the the overall sentiment was that I, I felt like it was positive, upbeat, very collaborative, and I'll have some updates around that collaboration during the COVID-19 update. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, um, business manager's report. Hello everyone, I sent it out. If you have any questions, please let me know. I don't have anything specific to add. I do know later in the agenda is couple of discussion items for me. Okay. Been very crazy in the business office. I bet with all of the, the audit stuff. Um, 
I'm just now receiving a message from a member of the public who wants to join our meeting. So um, please just bear with me for one moment while I share some information. Okay. Thank you, Tara. You're welcome. Does anyone have questions for Tara? Hello, this is Tammy. Um, Christy didn't send out the report that Tara is talking about. Is that something that should be on a, a is that posted on the site or something? We'll get it on the site. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if Tammy should be added um, to the email group that receives our reports so she can link them to the minutes. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll, I thought I'll that was that already the case, but thank you. All right. Um, and the principal's report. Just that ongoing document that we have. Um, does anyone have questions about that or do the principals have anything that you would like to add or highlight? Um, the principal's report that I have um, is still showing June 16th, but. There, there's one sent out in the packet with mine. Right, okay. Do you want me to share that right now again? And that would be perfect, thank you. Yeah, because the one I clicked on doesn't look like what I have looked at. So one second. Great, thank you. And the only thing comment we wanted to make was that um, it's more maybe associated with Tara's report. Just that um, we are waiting for a meeting. We want to set up a meeting with Tara because we know there's some things that are inaccurate or not in the right places that we want to work through that with her. Okay. So should be there now for you great it's worth noting this is reed it's worth noting that this is the first month of a new format for our principal's report uh, mm -hmm. so that all the principal's reports in the supervisory union are consistent in format and covering the same uh, strategic goals for the supervisory union um, and we've identified roughly those three goals uh, we spent the afternoon wordsmithing these, so these are the general areas of the goals, but uh, their goals are not in their final format, uh, but they generally will, will cover the topics of our MTSS student support system, uh, proficiency-based learning and personalization, and uh, community partnerships, uh, and kind of student voice and choice uh, for that third goal. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, I like this format. It seems very clean and clear. I like it as well. We, we also received a letter of resignation today. Sorry, Andrew. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say I, I like the format as well. I like how you tie it to the goals. But I do did like kind of getting general knowledge about uh, things that are going on in school as you did in the old one. So maybe they'll have some of those things in there too. <laughs> anyway. Go ahead. Reed, we're going to hold on to that letter to the SU board because it's actually an SU employee. Oh, all right. OK. Um, any questions for the principals or any um, feedback on this new report? Okay, I guess we're moving right along. Great, thank you. Um, so that brings us to discussion items of the Finance and Facilities Committee. All right, so that's me and the principal. So we are, we adopted a finance and a, in addition a facilities committee in um, FBUD. We're looking to adopt these committees in RUD and potentially an RSUD to start. The concept being that the Finance Committee will meet monthly with, so it'll have board member representation up to three. Um, it'll meet with um, Reed, is gonna be the lead principal for the Finance Committee, and Tara. And you guys would be looking over general expenditure, monthly expenditure reports, 
revenue reports as, as they're up and running. And you will also be taking a lead. We're looking at budgeting very differently this upcoming school year. And during the admin retreat, we talked about the need to really uh, budget, redo the budget in general and look at what is the budget support for 21-22 and get away from the current budget lines and the budgets that we have and redo it from the bottom up. So we know exactly what is where. I think it's gonna make your expenditure reports much more easy to follow and read. And so that committee will be involved in that. The idea would be that that committee is meeting monthly and then that committee will be reporting back out to the board and they will, that committee will have standing reports monthly to the board. Um, the idea being that, the, you know, there's just a closer relationship with the board and administration around that budget development, but also on the progress monitoring of the expenditures and revenue side. So that's a brief overview of that. The facilities committee would be help be helping with strategic planning around the facilities and operations side of the organization. But in addition to that, I think it's really uh, prudent that we come up with a plan of attack of how we're budgeting reserve accounts and a long-term range plan for upkeep and maintenance of our building buildings okay. and so those two committees will have to interact at times but you know for a while they'll meet separate but then when we get to that part of the budget process they'll meet and develop the maintenance and operations side of the budget together and then present it to the board. So what the board's gonna see in August is the calendar will be broken down as the budget process goes month by month around student support services, around you know universal instruction and programming, which has supply lines and everything around universal instruction and teaching force. And then it'll get to operations and maintenance and we'll take a chunk of that one month at a time. And so these committees would be helping work with the administration to do that work and then be presenting to the full board as we go along. So, so at this point, are you looking for volunteers? Discussion, if you decide that that's something you wanna act on, then you should make a motion to adopt those committees and then appoint members. Okay. So thoughts? I move that we adopt those committees. Okay, so Bob moved that we adopted those committees. Do I have a second? This is Lisa, I'll second. Um, is there any discussion before we vote on this? I think it would be good to have these committees uh, to, you know, one to monitor um, finances for month to month and come up with the updated plan like what Jamie talked about. And then also I think, you know, having a facilities uh, group as well is a good idea. You know, buildings, buildings age and there's always things that need to be fixed and it always helps to have a plan on how those things are gonna be done when they come up so that it's not, it's not an emergency. It's something that's anticipated in advance. Mm -hmm. I agree. And who, um, Jamie, did you say who is gonna be running the facilities committee? Uh, so Owen's gonna be the principal that oversees the facilities and Reed will oversee the finance. Okay. And then we would be looking for two to three board members to join both of those committees. And Tara will be with the finance committee and I'll probably be the liaison with the facilities committee. And just as a refresher, could you give the breakdown? So two to three board members, Tara and Reed on the finance, um, Owen and you on the facility piece. Is that the correct representation on yep. those two committees? Did yep. I leave anyone out? Nope. There's no community members present on those committees. No will there be, is there an idea that there will be other people beyond the board members and administration? There certainly can be. I was gonna leave that up to your committees to decide. Okay. The head of ma you, certainly your head of maintenance will be on the two facilities committees. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Owen posted a comment that board members are community members. Um, I that is true. I think that we have community members who are interested in um, being a part of things from time to time who don't necessarily want to make the board commitment. Um, but I, I am heartened to hear that people, um, that the committees can can make those choices. Yep, I think you could absolutely make those choices. And I would encourage you to bring in expertise as you need it. I mean, I could totally see the facilities com committee needing to do that at times mm -hmm. and possibly the finance committee. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion before we vote on this? Okay. Um, all in favor of um, creating a finance and a facilities committee, um, please say aye. 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 <laughs> all right. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that unanimously carries. Um, at this point, do we have any volunteers from the board knowing that we need between two and three board members per committee? So should we, um, is there anyone who would like to join the finance committee? I would. Yeah, I'll do that. So that's Bob and Andrew. Anyone else? I, I guess I would. Yeah. Okay. So that's three. Um, does everyone feel comfortable with that? I I feel comfortable with that. That's the maximum number we can have without a quorum. Um, and I appreciate the three of you volunteering to fill that role. Okay. Anyone else have strong feelings? So we might have to have a, a runoff or <laughs> no? Okay. Um, and facilities. Is there anyone who would like to be on the facilities committee. I would. This is Lisa. Okay. And I can help with that one too, Chris. All right. Anyone else? Um, thank you very much. I feel like I'm pretty much at capacity between the executive board and um, full board and our regular meeting. So I appreciate all of you stepping into these roles. Thank you. Thanks guys. This will get up and running in September. All right. That's exciting. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, policy committee. So that was just an update that the policy committee met. Uh, there's some policies that will be coming to you guys. We have two that were adopted by the policy committee that will come in front of the full board in August. And uh, Lisa, I was going to let you update them about where we're at in regards to equity policy. Yeah, um, there are two people from um, Vermont Law School who are working with local school districts to help them develop equity policy. Um, so at the um, policy committee meeting the other night, um, Mary Ellen pitched their proposal, was, which was that students, community members, um, work together with uh, these students who have spent the last two years at Vermont Law School focused on equity. And I'm not remembering their names right now, unfortunately. Um, and so those committees, hopefully by November, would be able to bring us a draft equity policy that we could um, look at and discuss. Um, I think it'll probably go to the policy committee and then come to individual boards and the full board. Um, but I thought that was exciting. And I have really appreciated the number of young people who've been active in um, pushing for equity in our communities. And I'm appreciative that this gives them an outlet to work on something substantial and meaningful. Did I miss anything, Jamie? No, that's great. And there will be professional development for faculty and staff that aligns to the procedures of the policy. So we're excited about that. And that would take place next year. I think I, I said this the other night at the policy committee meeting. And so Jamie will probably get tired of hearing me say it. I think it's also really important that this extend to um, 
support staff and coaching staff. I just think about the number of times that I hear things said um, at games or or that um, unfortunately happens not in a classroom setting. And so I'd love for our coaches also to have that training in order to coach. So. That will happen. OK. Thank you. Any questions about any of the policies? All right. Um, so that brings us to the COVID-19 update. Um, so I've got a bulleted list here that I want to hit on the board, and I'll, I'm happy to entertain any questions, and the principals will too, about where we're at in the process. The task force recommendations came out last week. Since then, um, there was an announcement by the governor that an executive order is going to take place that delays the opening of schools until the 8th of September. Um, there's still talk about what that means for student days. We won't know that until after August 25th, because that's a legislative decision, and they are not due back in, in until August 25th around that whether that will affect student days or not. So we need to move forward with planning um, at this point, knowing that we have 177 days in the calendar. The, you know, the minimum requirement is 175. So I'll be working with the union to discuss what in-service time will look like uh, prior to the start of the school year now, which will be on the 8th. Uh, then the full SU board will have to come back together and adopt an additional revised calendar due to that announcement this week. Uh, we're meeting with the transportation company tomorrow to talk about exactly what transportation will look like. In addition to that, um, we've got a transportation survey that's going out to all families on Monday in regards to finding out who absolutely needs transportation in order to get to school. We'll use that to help us plan routes. We're gonna strongly encourage families to transport students if possible, um, just due to the recommendations or requirements in regards to social distancing and uh, med checks on buses. One of the things in transportation is parents will be required to stay at the bus stop until the med check is completed. Because what we can't have is young students being at the bus stop, we do a med check, they don't pass, and now we have a student that we have nowhere for them to go. So that is going to be clearly communicated to families during that uh, survey next week. The in-person schedules for the elementary schools are all gonna be released next week. Um, principals are meeting tomorrow to put the final touches on that. Those schedules will go across the entire SU. It will provide flexibility for families at the end of the day and give school staff um, time to do appropriate planning and cleaning at the end of the day um, to ensure that schools are safe for a return the following day. In-person will happen five days a week and there will be uh, Education will happen from eight to three, but there will be a possibility for parents to pick students up earlier in the day if needed. Um, and that will all be released on Monday. The Virtual Learning Academy, Lindy Stetson, the principal from Stockbridge is gonna oversee that for the SU. We will have one point principal for the entire SU for the Virtual Learning Academy. And um, that will also have a schedule released on Monday that is looking like a regular school day from 8.30 to 2.30 with regular, regularly scheduled um, classes occurring throughout the day, social time at lunch happening, um, and office hours and extra support and intervention toward the end of the day. So it's going to be very different than what it looked like in the spring. And all those details are going out prior to students signing up for the virtual learning platform. Um, Again, the calendar is going to have to be adjusted, so we're going to have to pull the full board together once that those final touches are done. Um, we're going to work in coordination with the, the union in regards to what in-service time and planning looks like. Um, and we continue to move forward with uh, purchasing of PPE across the SU. Um, we've pulled all of our SU nurses together. They've met. Um, to ensure that they're on the same page in regards to implementing the recommendations. Um, Shane, our COVID, uh, our COVID WRVSU COVID coordinator, is meeting with all heads of maintenance and building principals over the next upcoming week 
um, or two, to discuss what needs there are to ensure we have proper cleaning supplies uh, purchased and that we have those routines implemented with fidelity across the SU. We continue to move forward with the purchasing of tents and outdoor um, supplies to try to do as much outdoor education as possible. That's the idea across the entire SU. And um, I'm meeting with Reed and Owen on Friday to discuss what the middle and high school schedules will look like. And I know that they've got a survey going out too to gather more feedback from families before we release those. And if you have specific questions about what the high school or middle school schedules will look like, they'll entertain those. Um, and so we've been doing a great deal of work. Um, it was a it was a fairly significant chunk of our time at the admin retreat over the next the last two days. I'm continuing to provide regular updates and communication. A letter will go out from me on Friday answering all questions that have come in over the past week. And that will go out to all families across the SU, in addition to me letting them know all these updates I just told you tonight um, and that they can expect those surveys and details around what the in-person um, schedule will look like for the elementary students the first of next week. That will go out on Monday. So all that will go out to the greater community on Friday. Um, we've been, I've received a significant response to the idea that we're gonna work, move forward with elementary students in person. Um, there are some SUs around us who are not doing that. Um, that is posing a bit of a challenge, I think, for us in regards to workforce. I attended a VSA meeting yesterday. We're not the only ones in the situation um, around, you know, um, you know, SUs nearby not having the exact same schedule. Um, it's a frustration, I think, for all superintendents across the state um, that, 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 that that's, this situation has occurred. Um, we are not the, the uh, but so you know, the Vermont uh, Association of Pediatrics has strongly encouraged elementary students to be in school five days a week, as well as the Agency of Ed and the Department of Health. Um, those statements came out yesterday, um, so I feel good that we're moving forward with that option. Um, but we're also providing flexibility um, throughout the in instructional day and also the fact that we have a virtual learning academy for families that aren't feeling safe to send their kids back yet. We totally understand that. Um, or that there could be other, you know, extenuating circumstances why it wouldn't make sense for their children. And so we will move forward with the virtual learning academy throughout the entire year. We're asking for families to commit to a uh, trimester to begin with, just because I'm worried about it shuffling back and forth and the fact that the virtual learning academy is going to be staffed by teachers across the SU, not necessarily teachers that are actually in the building for that particular student. We're going to be clear about that for families when they sign up. Um, and we're doing that because we're trying to work really efficiently. And I think we're, we suspect that we're going to have a sense of what our CARES money will look like here in the next few days, an approximate amount. Um, and so that's good news as well. And so we continue to look to make purchases that are specific to CARES money um, so that we can easily track that and get reimbursed for that. I suspect that the CARES money will be enough to um, pay for the cost that we're incurring right now uh, due to COVID-19. That's my sense based on information I've been receiving. Will the tents be able to be billed um, to CARES? To CARES yeah. money? Yeah, we're going to uh, bill it to CARES. In addition to, we have some 21C money, since 21C is using it, that we will mm -hmm. also use. Because uh, we had some carryover in regards to our 21C money for after school programming. So we're going to use some of those funds to offset awesome. the cost as well. Um, do we have any sense so far of the number of staff who may need to work remotely? That information in the forums went out on Monday, only Wednesday, I guess, um, to gather that information. I'm meeting with faculty and staff all day on August 7th to review those forms uh, with Lisa Blair and HR. And so we'll have a mm -hmm. better then in regards to who will be able to return and can't. Um, we believe that we will be all right in regards to staffing right now. I have no reason to believe that we are not going to be able to staff in open schools. 
We are moving forward and we'll use CARES money. We are looking to get more uh, regular everyday subs in place that become part of the school climate and culture this year. In the event that when we are short staffed, that we have those folks to deploy um, and we'll use CARES money to um, pay for those folks. Okay. Any other questions um, from board members or uh, potential? Yeah, this yeah. is Lisa. Um, I, I read most of the COVID task force report from last week and as I was reading it, I could just, I mean, I, I appreciate all the steps that are being taken from taking temperatures when students get on the bus to having separate ways to enter if you're getting off a bus or getting dropped off or driving yourself. But every step, though, I know it's important. It just made me wonder how much is going to be left of the day for students to actually learn. And it's I'm sure you guys were talking about that kind of stuff during your retreat. But, um, you know, that's as a parent, that's the first thing that came to mind. And now, you know, when you're encouraging students to either get brought to school by their parents or to get there on their own, what I could envision is a log jam of parents with students in their cars waiting for the students to be able to enter the school, to have their temperature taken, and for the parent needing to stay there in case the student needed to go back. And that means that a parent could be sitting there in their car with the line of traffic just waiting for it could be a half hour to an hour before they can go back you know head to work or an I think we're going to try to have multiple entry points for the different grades okay um spread out across the campus that All would right. be really communicated so we're not looking at one entry point to buildings right. um due to those concerns Oh, and what we, we're trying to learn from our after our summer program. What we've heard is that uh, the check-in takes about a minute. Okay. And so hence we understand that we're going to need multiple points of entry. And lots of staff to do that. Yep. So that'll be teachers before school gets started showing up. No, no, we, we'll look to utilize uh, training up our support staff. Uh -huh. nurses, so we we'll incur some extra costs there, but again, that's what the CARES money is for. Right. So that won't, those extra hours will be CARES money that, that it'll incur. Okay. <laughs> well, I know we're all just figuring this out. It's just overwhelming to me as I think about all the possibilities where things could require attention or things could go wrong. And um, so I hope you have some plan B's and plan C's in place as well. Yeah, I mean, remember originally, that's why we had the student startup calendar the way we had it, right? Yeah. Um, I, I was not a superintendent, I don't mind saying this publicly, in favor necessarily of opening September 8th, because I really enjoyed our calendar. It gave us time to say, today didn't work, we got to address it. Yeah. And so now we're starting up on the 8th of September, which is a Tuesday, and we've got a four-day work week. So I got to figure that out. The admin team has been talking about it. Um, remember before we had a day on a Friday so we could adjust over the weekend. And then we were going to go four and a half days and adjust again on a Friday. So we've lost that opportunity right now. But there doesn't mean we can't have some cold run um, possibilities where you invite folks in so they see what it looks like prior to the start of school and so that we can learn from that. And I, my sense is we may very well be doing that. Yeah. And then are extra rooms going to be needed? It seems for various um, tasks, it seems like we're going to need some extra space to handle. Well, I thought the principal to speak to that about what their ideas are. I know they plan on using uh, tents and being outdoors a lot. Yeah. And um, in addition, my sense is based on other superintendents around the area, about 15 to 20% of students have been selecting the virtual option. So we have to take that into account in regards to our numbers as well. Mm -hmm. Principals, do you want to add to that? I know that you plan on doing a lot of outdoor learning. Sure, I, I could start if you want. Um, Lisa, these are great questions and I encourage folks to ask questions and send us questions because we have never managed opening a school in a pandemic before. <clears throat> and. We're taking it all very seriously, and our first 
first thing we think about is safety. So that's the first part. Uh, we don't have all the details, but one of the ways that we're thinking about at the White River Valley Middle School is when students and faculty are on campus, that they will be outdoors completely all day. Planned, and we're going to try to plan to do that all the way through Thanksgiving. And we can we can answer some questions about cold weather or rain or thunder and lightning, and we're working on that. We have a team of teachers that have volunteered to work on this all summer. It's been really really amazing how folks are stepping up. And of course, they're well, they're big investment. We, <clears throat> we need things like tents and we need coolers and fans in the tent. And we're thinking that the bathroom, so I could give a quick example if that's okay with folks. Jamie, you all right if I give yeah. like our current thinking about the middle school? And we're gonna meet with Jamie on this, nothing's final, remember that. But there was also something in Digger and uh, I was also interviewed today, by the way, by 60 at 60 by six, which is part of 60 minutes. Yeah, everybody's interested and we don't have a full plan yet. It's really scary to talk to people. But I had permission from Jamie to do that. <clears throat> and, um, you know, around the country, people are figuring this out, right? But we're good about this in, in uh, Vermont and especially on the Bethel campus, we've been outdoors. We have four trained, formerly trained outdoor educators, which really helps immediately. Our thinking is to create pods of 10 students and two adults in each pod. Each pod would not interact with any other pods. They would, while they're at school, all of their at school time would be in that group of 12. Each of those groups, and we are counting on every student in case they all come, we have 141, we'd have 14 pods, and we would, um, everybody would have a spot that would be outdoors in a tent area. They also would have spots that they could go to that would be very safe and we would need to split them away from the building because a group of 12 would need to share two classrooms that have adjoining doors is my calculation. And then we were also uh, Lindley Brainerd who's a select person and a shop teacher at our school and just a wonderful person has been very helpful and she and I are working on work, uh, maybe contacting the local four churches and using their spots if we had to, the town hall, the Arnold block itself, and maybe even GW. So we would have alternate spots if we could predict that there was gonna be super foul weather. So that's an example. Each pod would also have a portalette because we don't wanna dig toilets in all, we don't want 140 people using the toilet in the woods. It would probably back up in a bad way. And we're going to teach the kids really, you know, like the, the idea of like leave no trace and that they would be responsible. To if you use that porta potty, you clean that porta potty. That doesn't mean empty it, but you back your way out. And we're going to teach them that whatever you do, you put it back the way it was or better. We're going to try to focus this in three big areas outdoor education when they're on campus, outdoor education, restorative practices which will create the concept of not an advisory, but a circle of a community and they would build community. And that would be the beginning part and really focus on social emotional learning and keeping them healthy and safe when they're there. And then we're also looking at an anti-racist literacy unit that would either be outdoors and indoors or just outdoors. And our, we had a team attend the Middle Grades Institute this summer and work on that. Another team attended the Middle Grades Institute and took everything we learned about our remote learning and uh, analyzed it and improved it. And with all those resources at, at uh, MGI, even though it was virtual, you know, there's hundreds of people they have drawn on. And we have created a way to use the Google Suite that's going to just make it so much better for parents and kids. And we're going to share that SU wide, by the way. And, the, and I think I got it all there for now. We don't know everything and we know some stuff. And we're looking at possibly, uh, our thinking right now is some version of partial remote and partial on site. So that we're talking about having two groups. So we have 141 kids, let's round to 140 for numbers. If we could have 70 kids on campus per day with their teacher leaders, and then when they're the other group of kids would be learning remotely at the same time so they would alternate back and forth so in theory we would only need seven tents and seven places because we could share those and make sure they were cleaned each night 
I think I'm getting this down, but you know what? Every time we talk about this, we learn more. And I always keep reminding everybody, the number one thing, we always say respect, responsibility, and safety. We need to put safety at the top of the list right now. And we also need to remind each other we're in a pandemic and we're not doing school. We're doing something differently and we're gonna be learning. And we're gonna also be making sure people are, are socially and emotionally stable and well. So we're talking about possibly having, an example might be t students would be come to school either by bus, they would have had their first point of contact at the bus, or if they come by car, their first point of contact would be on campus. And they go directly to their pod and their leader. Their leader, one of their leaders has already collected their food for the day. Their breakfast, their snack, and their lunch, and it's in a cooler at their site, and, and they, that's where they start and end their day. So um, that's the thinking right now for the middle school. And I think it works really well. And the Tarrant folks are really interested and helpful to us. And they are supportive of this. And we know it works really well with the, the middle school experience. It fits perfectly. So can I ask another question? Ask 10, it's your birthday. Oh, okay, well, I'm 29, so I'll ask 29 questions. Nice. Uh, so. What about, I know that, how are you gonna keep kids from interacting with each other, especially if they're not in the same group, especially if, you know, ever all these kids are missing each other and they wanna yeah. touch, they wanna hold hands, they wanna yeah. hug. Sure. And, and so there's gonna be social emotional stuff if there's two students that are really good friends that are in separate groups, so they're not gonna be able to interact at all. And then at what point once they're out of school and they're walking away, are you supervising to make sure they're social distancing? Because an example is I've got, you know, my kids have been social distancing very well. And, you know, we really limit interactions, though each one of our kids have certain friends that they spend time with, that mm -hmm. they're kind of, it's their, um, their oh. germ pool, I guess, right? Yeah. So they, they've been touching, they've been, you know, they've not been social distancing. I, I don't want to know the details. So, right, okay. but. <laughs> But basically, we've got we've got that dynamic, and how does that interface with the school? Well, um, I mean, I feel like I can jump in, Owen, because this is a question sure. we're going to keep all, all around. I think, Lisa, we're going to teach, we're going to model, we're going to ask students to follow the expectations safely, but this is something parents have to weigh. There's no way the school can say that students aren't going to come into close contact because we can't monitor every student at all times. And so that's why we're offering the virtual option. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna have informational nights to discuss these things across the SU. Uh, cert certain schools have already started and Shane's joining them as the COVID coordinator. But that is something parents have to take into account. I was at number 10 pond two weekends ago and there were kids all over the place swimming in and interacting. And so I think for us to think that students aren't going to be co-mingling after they leave, it would just, it would be that we have our head in the sand. Right. And we're, what I think we have to say is we're taking every step we can to mitigate risk. And that's the framework we're gonna go from, is that we're taking all these steps and precautions to mitigate these risks, but there are still risks involved. And one more question was around the, um, in the COVID, 19 task force report there was um students can, can decide whether they want to do virtual or in person by each trimester but once you've decided you're in it now is you're that still if you're in virtual and you want to come back because we're planning differently it also in my letter said it's by superintendent approval if a student starts and says this isn't for me we'll permit them to be in virtual okay and we'll make that clear in the next communication. Okay. We we have a community member who asked a question in the chat. So Annette Rhodes asked, um, will students who need intervention get them in the building or under a separate tent? Um, I think it'll be a combination of both depending on what the student needs for interventions and how many times a right. week. But we are certainly, if, a student has interventions within their their IEP or their uh, 504 plan or their target or intensive intervention plan. 
then they'll receive those interventions and those are the logistics principles need to be working out in combination with Don. Yeah. I also uh, think that, you know, um, I think we need to, the way we're offering it is a good way, but there will always be a need to be responsive to what's in front of us. If the middle school is not in the building and they're on campus, we have a whole building that's available. It could also be used in another way for the school. We've talked about that as the, you know, maybe the librarians are like using the windows to hand out books. We have to consider how we'll do Chromebooks. And, you know, we can also do some of that more passive engagement on the remote days. Not that intervention is, but we're meeting tomorrow with uh, the three principals and our, our new leadership team of the, the intervention folks on both the uh, MTSS and um, SEL side of things. So we're gonna start planning that as well. SEL is for uh, social emotional learning. To see. You know that. Thank you. So that's the MTSS coordinator, Shane Oaks and Sandy Tracy, along with the new hire, Ashley Grote. So this will be our first day with Ashley tomorrow. And Mindy Beth Pike. Nice. Is there thinking that there'll be, um, and I'm sorry if I missed this, because um, I've been reading a lot about COVID in schools, um, but um, is there thinking that there will be some sort of education piece for parents? Because I think what Lisa noted about social distancing and, um, you know, not if your kid wakes up with a little fever, not giving them Tylenol and sending them to school, um, which I know is reality for a lot, local a lot of families. Districts have been, local districts have started holding informational nights. Sharon's holding theirs yeah. tomorrow. Shane will be at all of them. I will attend the ones that I can when I don't have a board meeting. In yeah. addition to that, we'll have SU wide ones starting up as well. That okay. will be offered to all communities for questions and answers and education. We also plan on doing education for parents if in regards to their child attending the virtual learning academy. So that will be a caveat mm -hmm. that parents have to attend an orientation as well as students. We also want to do some pre-assessment prior to the virtual learning academy to see exactly where students are performing academically so that we have them grouped appropriately throughout the virtual learning academy. Okay, that sounds great, thank you. So the extra week helped us with that stuff. Yeah. So I've got a couple of things. Um, one being, I know uh, it's gonna be difficult for um, teachers when they have students in another system that has a different schedule. And I know in the past, you know, on individual special occasions, we've let um, students from other districts come in tuition free. and I think as a board, we should make a blanket offer that any staff need or would like to have their students come to our yeah, school. You know, I'm, I'm gonna come to the SU board about that. I need to do some more checking with legal. That's something that's come up at the VSA in general. Okay. And I just need to make certain that we are permitted to do that. Okay. I know we've done it in the past, like the board's approved exceptions or students. Yeah, yeah, and I think I'm going to come to you with that. I just need to make certain I double check, dot the I's, and cross the T's. Yep. Okay. Um, my other question is about the Virtual Learning Academy. Um, how much flexibility for parents will there be with that? Like, is it going to be they need to have their students online attending classes throughout the morning? Well, we're really um, going to look for them to commit that their their children are online throughout the day. Um, they don't have to be on the entire time. So the way we're going to do it is all the lessons will be video recorded by the teacher. The lesson will be provided that way via Google. And the teacher will have check-in times throughout the day during those instructional blocks that then reinforce the lesson. Uh, in addition to also office hours. So... It's not gonna look like it did prior. This idea of um, you can just get on at night or you can get on just you know at from seven to nine, 
That's not what we're looking to do here because what we're not doing is maintaining. We're looking for students to, to grow academically. Right, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, I do think it would be good to offer some flexibility for parents. Well, mostly I'm, I'm really concerned about parents opting for homeschool, a uh, large majority of our families doing that. And I know that there's some families who, you know, don't want their children to be on screens, but don't feel comfortable sending their kids back. And, you know, if there's a set curriculum and they're kind of doing some, some of the work offline and keeping their kids up with checks in and stuff like that, I would hope that something like that might I'm be. I'm sure that, that, you know, I, I don't want to also speak for Lindy, right? Yeah, she of course. She's the principal for it. Um, we'll be as flexible as we can. There's a question about the hybrid. I would say our hybrid goes as far as students will be able to leave the elementary school early each day. Exactly what that time is yet is not known, uh, but there's not gonna be a hybrid in regards to elementary students coming two days a week and doing virtual three. I do, we don't have the staff to pull that off. Right. Really, that's what it came down to. To do a full virtual, to do an in-person, and to do a hybrid, we just don't have the uh, amount of staff we need at the elementary level. Right. When you, when no, when I, I think that makes sense. And, you know, it doesn't seem like hybrid provides that much more, you know, mitigation of risk compared to just all day or, you know, compared to remote. Um, anyway, no, I was more for student for parents who wanted to be more involved, but, you know, like, give them an option to stay connected with the school that isn't going full homeschool, but would give them a larger role in, in supervising their kids, you know, as opposed to having them watching lessons all day, you know? Um, you know, I, I totally, and we'll, we'll continue to adjust the virtual academy based on feedback we get. Right. I'm, I'm telling you what we've got right now is a potential draft. Um, and, you know, part of it will be what is the outpouring of number of students who want to participate versus not. Uh, like I said, colleagues have told me that it's about 15 to 20 percent is the return most folks are getting on the virtual option. Okay, thanks. Tammy, did you want to follow up? Did you have a okay. question? The context You're of the word, I'm not on mute, right? The context no. of the word hybrid um, in these discussions has been used, and I th I, I describe it, and so I might be uh, kind of simplifying it, either on-site or virtual. And so when someone says a remote hybrid um, or a remote day, um, that leads me to think I didn't understand what I had read. So. Ooh. What I had read was families would need to choose either in-person or remote learning. And so I was confused by the usage of the word remote hybrid and a remote day. That, um, that so is the case, Tammy, in all of our elementary schools uh, that go through eighth grade or for sixth grade across the SU. Your middle and high school has a lot more numbers, of course, than any of my other schools in the SU. So they may actually be on campus certain days and off campus others. I can tell you, I use probably the wrong term and I think we're finding our language on this with the pandemic and maybe hybrid's wrong. I wrote in their mixed model, which comes out of Jamie's intro letter. And it's probably a better term that, and it says this could potentially require a mixed model of simultaneous instruction via virtual and in person. It makes a lot more sense. I apologize for the confusion. Thank you. Yeah. Crazy, huh? Mm -hmm. Just crazy. Well, Owen, I All like right. that nice model. I'm glad I wrote that. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> Work. Okay. Any other questions before we move off These this really great. topic? Thank you. Yes. Do, do we have any, have we got any response or any feedback on that? uh the the money or whatever that the state put out for having hvac systems evaluated have we ever heard anything back on that yeah we've been yeah. pushing forward with that you guys want to talk about where you're at with that 
Yeah, in South Royalton's campus, we had Efficiency Vermont in earlier this week uh, to review our systems. Uh, we have two ventilation projects in the work. We, I, I'll start by saying we've replaced all our filters and to the extent that our systems are cleaned and maintained and working according to the MERV uh, specifications, we're good there to restart the school um, where we're, we're not, uh, not where we'd like to be is in the nurse's office. And we're working with Efficiency Vermont in that grant to double the capacity of the outside vents uh, that go out of the nurse's office to pull more outside air through. Uh, so we're, that's not gonna be a big expense, I don't think, you know, probably $2,000 or less, uh, but we're hoping for that. The, the bigger expense is that the majority of our classroom ventilation systems are univents. So they're built into the walls of the school. They pull outside air in, uh, run it through the kind of floor equipment. Um, and that's all old and outdated. Um, and so the, the bigger quote will be, uh, what could we replace those with? So they're all on a single HVA system that's computer operated. So we can control the numbers of times that uh, the air circulates through a room in an hour, for example. Um, but that's gonna be a lot of money. Uh, who know and, and whether the current understanding of the grant that I have is that all the work has to be done by December 31st uh, and whether that, that can happen or not uh, that you know the companies in Vermont are going to be flat out trying to meet those deadlines once the money is approved so you know I'm confident that there's actually going to be money there though so that's good yeah uh, I one, one thing we've talked about uh, that both, as I understand, Bethel and uh, South Royalton have at this point, is we both have invested in uh, disinfecting equipment. So one of the, the things we've talked about uh, for our programs is a midweek uh, deeper cleaning where we would spray disinfectant in all the classrooms. And the benefit of the spray is that it can land inside keyboards, it can get underneath chairs, it can penetrate into the fibers of carpet in rooms that have carpet. Uh, so we're, we're feeling good that we made that investment. It took us so, almost four months to get it. Uh, we still haven't been trained by the vendor on how to use it yet, uh, but at least we've, we've got the equipment and the supplies uh, to disinfect when the time comes, so. Great, thank you. Yep. All right. Any other COVID related questions? I appreciate all the work that's been done and the thoughtfulness put into this planning. It's a lot to take on in a short period of time and a lot to think about the safety of staff, students and everyone involved. So I just want to express how much I appreciate this. Um, one quick comment on the air filtration stuff. Uh, have you considered getting some mobile air filtration things? just the like standalone air filtration things, just if, if something, you know, the fan in a classroom goes out or something, like having something where you could bring it in and maintain air filtering would probably be a good idea. There's, uh, now that there's a facilities committee and Lisa is 29 and she can drive and Chris, there's actually a facilities meeting on Friday, right, Reed? Uh, the yeah, door. there is. And in short notice, I think the sooner we could meet, the better. And we could crash maybe Reed's meeting and uh, bring John Hubble with us. But uh, we'll reach out after the meeting about that. I'm sure you're doing nothing. <laughs> all right. But it's the sort of thing, just so you know, it's like it's all hands on deck, as you might imagine. And we could use your help, Lisa and Chris, on the facility side. And I'm sure, God bless the budget committee, finance committee. Uh, I'm really a big fan of you all. All right. Um, so that brings us to end of the year finance projections. So we are still working through final reconciliations, as I indicated in my report. But given what we have done and identified so far, 
I still do project that you will end in a deficit. And the reason for that will not be a result of your own individual expenditures, but rather the special education additional assessment and the supervisory union additional assessment. So we're still working through getting those reconciliations done to have a more solid number as far as that impact. Given that Red has the largest portion of those assessments, it will obviously impact you the largest. And you guys have a, a full SU board meeting on August 24th, of which the SU will be prepared to talk to you about the why of those things and the steps we're putting in place to resolve those as we move forward. It'll be a detailed report. That will be the main agenda that night in addition to COVID. And then as far as, that's for your general fund. As far as food service is concerned, as of numbers on Monday, which we're still working obviously through the COVID additional expenditure reimbursements, if we can get any of that money back, food service right now is looking at about a $117,000 deficit. which is obviously separate Thank from you. the general fund. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're not, we're not happy about this. Um, we're gonna go to the full SU board to talk about why we believe these things have been occurring on August 24th and with a plan of action of how we're gonna attack them. The finance committees are a part of that. Um, in addition to just changing our budgeting practices as we move forward but it's also why coming into this school year, we haven't replaced some outgoing staff. And we're also taking um, at the SU level, Don McMahon's been at analyzing our costs across the SU and we're taking steps and putting steps in place already to make certain that we're reducing special ed spending for this upcoming school year. And I can talk about more of those specifics of what we're doing at the SU meeting on, in August. Um, I met with all the, the admin team yesterday. We spent a good afternoon on the budget and finance area about what I believe the areas are that have been getting leading us into these areas around deficit spending. And we discussed the idea and nature of we have to be unbelievably frugal this upcoming school year because this just this is not going to happen we're just done with this and so i also come to you guys after that august meeting in september with some proposals about how we tend to these deficits because i don't want to carry them on the books and so we'll have some proposals for you in september about how we can clean this up any the, questions I mean, if there's any that uh, as much detail as I want to go into before we go into the SU board, because this is really an SU issue, is that there's really two areas that we know we need to address. One is in regards to special education, and there's other issues and concerns in regards to how we were budgeting federal revenues and grants. And so those are the areas that Tara and I have been hyper-focused on along with Don and Mary Ellen to address over the last few weeks when we realized that's really the two areas of concern. Yeah. Um, for our budget, are we uh, have any kind of outstanding expectations for reimbursement for COVID expenses or anything like that that might make things look better or is that all taken into account? Well, part of the issue with the CARES money is, is that if we use money from CARES for this past year's budget, 1920, Tara can correct me if I'm wrong, but they are going to then take that off of our end fund reimbursements for this upcoming school year. I have to be very careful how, what and how I submit expenditures. If there is any way that it can be identified that an expenditure was in fact budgeted for but it was just the money was used so an example we budgeted to have supplies in our budgets we had to buy additional supplies 
to send home to family. If items like that, they can utilize that and say, nope, we're gonna make that an offsetting revenue for you in FY21, we're deducting that from your education fund payment in FY21. If it is purely an unbudgeted, absolutely can prove it documentation wise expenditure, I can submit that and that will not impact our FY21. So every invoice that's currently coded as a COVID expenditure, we have to look at every individual invoice and determine is there any way that this can be construed as an already budgeted for item or not. So FY20 reimbursements for CARES money will be very limited. We do have a time frame for FY21 CARES money. It is from now and July 1st until December 30th. That is the time frame of those additional expenditures that we can claim reimbursement for under the CARES money. And that would be those exact same things that were purely COVID expenditures that were not budgeted for. The tents are a prime example of that. That is not something you would normally have in your school system. And we didn't budget for that. So that would purely be a COVID-19 expenditure that I could request CARES money for. The some of the things that Jamie was referring to earlier as far as support staff covering from morning check-ins, we will have to have that specifically identified separately outside of their contract time. It's outside of the budget. That is clearly going to be able to be identified as an additional expense as a result of COVID. Yeah, we're also looking to bring in, like I said, more floating subs. And they'll have separate memorandums of understanding so that we can clearly document that that's COVID related. And how does the food service stuff? I mean, like we were give, doing all the meals, but not receiving the revenue that we normally would for a lot of that. Like, is that? You did receive revenue for your meals because it went through the summer meals program. So there was state reimbursement for the meals that were served. It would be the additional expenses that were resulting of having to package those meals, transportation of those meals. But at the same time, you already had budgeted for transportation. And if you utilized your school buses to do those deliveries, I can't identify that as a clear COVID expense because it was already a budgeted for line item. So I can't ask for money back in that, that situation. Or if I do, it's gonna come off your FY21 Ed Fund payment. So my recommendation is we don't do that, that we keep our Ed Fund payment the way it is and we use our CARES money now for all these costs that we know we're incurring, would be my recommendation. I mean, I, I really want us to have a tight, we come out of here in the black to, at the end of this year. I mean, there's, there's just no excuse for it. We have to. So I, I don't want to do anything that's going to damage that outlook. Right. Sounds good. So you know, we'll get more into it in the final. Other steps we've taken, all non-essential spending has stopped. But in addition to that, all purchase orders over a thousand dollars require superintendent approval across the SU, not just in Rutt. But at the end of the day, like I said, there's there were some things in regards to at the SU level that I'm going to go into in August. Um, that is part of the reason why you guys are in a deficit, specifically around um, grants and special education spending. We have to strengthen our multi-tiered system of supports. At the end of the day, that's what we have to do. There are some systematic things we have to do differently. Is it, was the deficit on the food, is that, was that just for our district or was that across the SU? That is only wrong. And uh, to speak to that, when I say we got to do business differently, I, I told the SU board and some of you were there, food service has to be on the agenda at the SU level as we move forward. I'm going to be pushing the boards to look at a food service contractor as we move forward. That's a set cost that we know we can control that provides a high quality product, but that we can budget for a subsidy and we know it's predictable and we're not incurring these types of deficits in food service.
I mean, the way I summar summarize it for the administrators is we have to restructure how we're doing business because the way we've been doing it isn't working. Thank you. Um, should we move on to the annual retreat? Okay. What was that, Tara? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. You're talking to me about a new higher title. It should be food service manager and not director. Okay. It's just, it's a thing with the feds and the way it works. Right, all right. Okay. So Tammy can capture that for the minutes, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll capture that for the minutes. Yeah, all right. Um, so are we moving on to the retreat agenda or? Um, or yeah, annual retreat? I think at least yep. you question that that be put on. Yeah, um, I just, you know, one of the things we've done at the annual retreat um, is <coughs> come come up with the data that we'd like to see based on um, effectiveness, et cetera, within our district. Um, so I'm wondering if that's the direction that we want to go, um, if we want to link some of that data to the goals that we're seeing um, show up in the principal's report. Um, I guess in terms of that agenda, um, I don't know, I'm a little conflicted because on the one hand, I'm interested in you know, data about student performance and all of those sorts of things. On the other hand, this is such an atypical year that it feels odd to be um, focusing heavily on on things that are so seemingly disconnected from just our COVID response. Um, so I guess I'm interested in entertaining a discussion about um, that retreat, which is typically a longer than usual meeting where we focus on, on bigger picture stuff than our, our average meetings. Well, I would, I would throw out there, um, if we had a retreat, it might be a worthwhile time for us to talk about just structures in general. Mm -hmm. And what do we want to prioritize through the budget process? Because as I've said to you since you hired me, I think the budget is your number one policy statement. And if we're going to build the budget and restructure the budget from the ground up, I think it's important to know what you guys want to make as priorities through that policy statement. I would think for the administration, that would be really helpful. Do other board members have thoughts about that? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I mean, I imagine most of the focus in the near term is going to be on the COVID response. But when we're building the budget, it's going to be for the following year when hopefully they'll the situation might be different. So we should probably be looking at more regular, potentially, you know, building the budget for a more regular school year. So talking about just overall goals and priorities and things would be good. I don't know, who knows what it's gonna be next year. Right, anyone else? I feel comfortable proceeding in that direction as well. Okay. Does that give you, does that, I feel like that gives us enough to craft an agenda, Jamie? Do you feel Yeah, I think we can work on it from there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, Do we have a date for it? What's that? Do we have a date for it? I don't know that we've set one yet. Um, sometimes it's easier a little further into the fall, so we have more of a sense of um, 
like we give administrators time to get the year started. I don't know what the preference will be this particular school year. Um, well, if we're going to focus on the budget process, it would be good to do it in September. Okay. I wouldn't want it to be any later. Excuse me. Yeah. Though. Okay. And I think last year it was in September as well. I think it was the Friday evening after the Tunbridge Fair. Okay. Oh, that's a fun event after Tunbridge Fair. Well, it was a week later. So. Yeah. No, we didn't. We didn't miss Tunbridge Fair. Oh, don't, don't, go, don't go crazy. Here. No, we would not be in a school board meeting on Tunbridge Fair Friday night. What's that? Blasphemy. I said we would not be in a board meeting on the Friday night of Tunbridge Fair unless there was something really emergent. Yeah. Um, all right. So that would work. Can we look? Can we look toward that third? Um, just pulling up a calendar. So that would be the 18th of September, that afternoon and evening. Does that work for everybody? Or do we want to choose a different day of the week? That works tentatively. <laughs> and so would this be in addition to or instead of the one on the 21st that we normally would have? I do imagine that there's going to be people who want to provide feedback on opening plans and all that stuff after the I think we'll have to do both. Yeah, yeah. I feel like both is, both is what we've typically done. Okay, good. I mean, it's a lot, but I think that that allows us to plan. It does not have to be a Friday, in my opinion. Um, well, person, I mean, I don't know. I don't have my board calendar in front of me. I, I just know Fridays are open. But, right. I mean, that's why we chose it last time, because they're open, and I feel like even more so with with COVID, um, it's not like there's a lot going on every Friday night. Is that the third week of September? I think so. But it's the third week we would have Tuesday night. If it's the third week, second week we would have Tuesday and Wednesday night. It'd probably be a Thursday. You could do it that Thursday if you wanted, if you prefer okay. to do it for a Friday. Um, and I'm assuming that are we meeting remotely? Is that what we should assume, or are we going to try to meet in person? I'd say I mean, we've had these discussions. Is that you know we're pulling students together? So their your monthly regular board meeting would be Tuesday, September fifteenth, that week. Okay. Your regular scheduled board meeting. And you could, if you wanted to do both, you could extend that meeting or, like Jamie, that's the only board meeting we have scheduled that week is Tuesday night. Okay. Right. I think having a separate date to talk about overall. Yeah, I think we need a separate date. So I, I'm yeah, going to say either pick the 17th or pick the 18th. Because that, that's going to be focused on, like we said, the budget development and things of that nature. Maybe some norms or, or things, but uh, I think we've got to, we're going to need that regularly scheduled meeting with all these other updates and stuff that's moving. I'm fine with either the 17th or the 18th. Um, I would vote for the 18th. Okay. Friday. What's the Any time? other? What's the time that we're looking at on the that day or either day? I think in the past we've started at like 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We do like a potluck dinner, which I don't know if we'll do. Um, and then we end by 7 or 8. So it's a good chunk of time. Yeah, so Friday's the only day that I'd be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to do it on Thursday. Well, let's do it. Let's pick up Friday and move on. Okay. And if anybody, if there's a conflict that arises or if things are really, I think we just need to plan to be flexible if we need to be. Yep. 
Okay. All right. Um, Wait, Ray, so did you did you say three thirty or four o'clock? What what's people's preference? The four o'clock. Four o'clock. Okay. So four to eight is what we'll plan for. Right. Okay. Um. So we already acted on the finance and facilities committees. Um, when we get into the area of new hires, um, I'm sure everybody saw, I should have added this to the agenda, so I apologize, um, that we did receive a letter from the union. Did everybody on the board receive that? Um, requesting that we reconsider um, the music position and the world languages position um, at the White River Valley High School um, and in our district. Um, so I've... I, I would entertain a conversation about that. Um, thoughts? Um, well, what is music instruction going to look like? Do we have any idea this fall? I mean, these, these are both elementary school, just to clarify. Yeah, we have a music oh, teacher right. on the Sorry. call here. Yeah. Well, there were specific task force recommendations around it. I think some music teachers are feeling more, com more comfortable about it than not, than others. My sense is there'll be virtual instruction occurring and composition and potentially some rhythmics, fundamentals in partnership with some PE, um, but it's not gonna look like it did in the past. And the administration has worked just so folks know we believe that we can meet the program needs without replacing these two positions. Even not during uh, COVID. Right. I guess that was my thinking, that if we can meet the needs of our students, which is what we discussed, and we're not removing them completely from the budget, we're, we're not removing them, we plan to fill them in the future, um, I feel comfortable staying the course um, with the decision we previously took or the recommendation that was to not fill them at this time. Anyone yeah, else sorry. have an thoughts to share about that? Of emergency. We got to make changes. Um, yeah, well, we that was Rodney, I think. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. Anyone else? I agree as well as Lisa. Okay. Yeah, I agree All too. Right. Uh, you know, given everything, we've got to be as judicious as we can be with our decisions in terms of how we spend and allocate the funds right now. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Who Who's speaking, please? Hi, Bridget Taylor. Um, I um, just have a quick question um, about, um, I, I guess my question is since world languages has been um, a logistical challenge, shall we say at the elementary level already, um, what actually is the plan to go forward with the resources we have on hand? Thank you. Don't all jump in at once. I mean, one of the things we've talked about with that department and at the administration level um, is that we are going to do more integrated um, learning across all grades, but specifically try to do some more experiential and integrated cultural programming at the elementary campuses that have more theme-based, longer range um, approach to it. Did I get that right, Owen and Andrew? Yes. And uh, we also were having trouble fitting in the uh, literacy time that we wanted to. And we also want to expand our math time. It's not that one's more important, but the foundational skills are essential at the elementary. So we're looking at a more embedded cultural piece with the art teachers and uh, with the classroom teachers. And that's given no pandemic. The <laughs> yeah. pandemic. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that sounds like it speaks to the foreign language that Bridget had asked yeah. about. 
Um, yeah. It is, so that answer remains silent on the music component. Um, Bridget didn't necessarily ask about that, but there were two topics identified here. So I thought I'd make sure to ask. So what about the music component that um, wasn't answered yet? Uh, I think it was, but I'll do it again. Um, the music piece, we have three full-time music teachers and what we were offering for music as an example in the middle school was uh, quite a bit of music and it was awesome. But with um, the financial trouble we're in, we were able to offer enough music electively. And we can also, all three music teachers, we challenged them to, to serve music between pre-K and 12, and they have. And the idea was to have them focus in specific areas of strength. So an example, Shannon Bonsignori is a, is a trained choral teacher. So she will be teaching and not, nobody's teaching chorus this year, by the way, right now. She will be teaching middle and high school chorus. And then she will also have time to be teaching some middle school and I think maybe elementary support. And then Carrie Cole's uh, really great with, and she's on the call, she can speak for herself, but she's great with um, elementary students and she's gonna be doing a lot of that general music with Josh and Shannon helping out. Josh will be, when we're back to music regular, will be serving as the instrumental teacher for the middle through high school. We did this at another board meeting, didn't we? But that's okay, I can, it's good for us to go back. It seems like years ago now with the COVID pandemic though. Yeah. Yeah, I think we had this discussion a couple of months ago um, and you yeah. know, it, it is interesting to think about the way that music instruction will be impacted by COVID for sure. I think long-term we would like to restore the mm -hmm. music position, but particularly this year when you know, a lot of the music's not going to be possible in the traditional sense anyway. I think it makes sense to hold off until we are back to normal more. My, one, my... Of, one of the things, though, as a school administrator is, I and I have loved this about you folks, and Jamie's right be, there also, is we'll bring you the recommendation, definitely, but um, we have, we really did push this and say, what can we offer and can we offer a program we're proud of, and we are. And, you know, I'm not saying, it's hard to say like, oh, we should cut. We're not fat anywhere. But other like schools don't have three full-time music teachers, uh, four full-time music teachers. And that doesn't mean we need to be like other uh, schools. But the other piece is if we start not, if we start taking away from literacy and mathematics in the elementary programming, we, and offering wonderful things, world language, outdoor education, health, we added those three things when we merged. They put a pressure on the classroom teacher to try to figure out a way to do that literacy and math and then add intervention. And we haven't even talked about the other essentials of art and PE and, and guidance. It's, they're not easy decisions, but- right. um, That's why I think the board needs to start this conversation around budgeting in September about what are your priorities. Yep. I appreciate that. And I also think that filling these positions right now, particularly related to world language and music in the very beginning of August would be next to impossible in terms of finding a high quality candidate. Um, so in terms of budgeting, I think one of the things I heard loudly and clearly through the merger process is that music, I mean, world language is important too, but music has been something that um, our communities have been really proud of and supportive of, and it's really a part of the culture in these two communities that that be something available to everyone. So while I'm hearing that there are so many other priorities, and obviously this pandemic has shown that schools do so much for our communities and our students, um, I also really just want to be sensitive to the fact that that's something that our community considers a strength and a value. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I contractually obligated to add on, as I always do, um, that the benefits 
to math comprehension from a strong music program are, are very clear um, that world languages connect to, um, you know, the English language in ways that really increase comprehension. Um, but thank you guys for that answer. I think, um, I think, you know, we're all doing the best we can during this pandemic anyway. Um, but I think those approaches are good. Um, I will take this opportunity to really shout out uh, Mr. Pauly, who's the only person I sort of had direct, um, not literally direct experience of, but as a parent of a high school student, to watch him rise to, well, everything I normally do is gone, now what, um, was, was really great. And I, I'm sure the other ma music teachers were doing the same, um, and it was really heartening to, to watch that. So thank you guys for continuing to have it on your radar, and uh, thanks for your answer. All right. Um, any other discussion about that? All right, new hires. So we, I believe you got resumes, mm -hmm. right? Christy told me you guys should have received resumes on each one of these candidates. Mm -hmm. said sent them to you. It's all new processes. You got them, Chris? Look at him. Chrissy's hitting home runs. What I like to hear. Really happy to know I said that. So I'll just have each principal just quickly give them just a brief overview of the folks that are joining our team. Why don't we each take one of them? I'll take Cass Bath. Cass Bath is returning. She was a high school mathematics teacher and she left to have a baby and do other things that are important. But now she's returning as a 50% FTE replacing Nancy Pageway as a White River Valley Middle School math interventionist. She comes with a boatload of talent. And, and math, actually, te math teachers are unicorns. There's a baby in that picture. Sorry, yeah, my assistant's here. Ashley Grote is gonna be working opposite me. She's the coordinator of student services um, and will be working with MTSS, um, and so we look forward to her joining us and helping us um, scope out all of our MTSS uh, services. Hi, Jordan. And Misha Johnson comes to us from the Randolph Schools, uh, where she's been a long time employee there and has been grooming herself to move up into a food service manager position. Uh, but there's kind of a, a ceiling there for her and uh, we are excited to be bringing her in and give her that opportunity. So over the last eight years, she's uh, taken all the courses that the state offers. So she's totally prepared to step into this role. Uh, and, and maybe more than anything else, she brings a lot of enthusiasm and we think she's gonna be great with the kids and really kind of incorporate the food into the learning, uh, which has always been something uh, that's been important to us. She's also um, training with Willie. We're proud of the hires. Thank you. Any questions about these new hires um, from any of the board members? Tammy, if you could just update your minutes to reflect food service manager, not food service director, please. It has been updated as it was identified earlier. Thank you. Thanks. All right, that brings us to our final public comment of the evening. There public that would like to jump in. I know that some people have commented throughout the meeting. Um, Tammy? Um, my comment is, when are those sessions on all those things we don't know about? Virtual learning, new classrooms, can I bring my lunch to school? I understand there's a letter coming out on the 31st of July, um, something on the 3rd of August, something on the 7th or 8th. Um, how's that word getting out? Where should parents be looking? Well, Tammy, you, you should be getting it in your email. And if you're not, please let, let the principals know. So those are email blasted to all parents and guardians. They are on the WRVSU COVID-19 
um, link on our webpage. They're on your Facebook pages. Um, and so those are all the means of how we're communicating. So they're on the, the White River uh, District Facebook page. They're on the White River Valley Supervisor Union Facebook page. They're on the link to our website. They're on your RUD website, and they'll be email blasted out through Blackboard. So there's no educational sessions right now, but they're yet to be announced. Is that correct? The informational updates, those yep. will be released either this Friday or next week. Okay. I just, for those parents who have come up with the magical date of an August 1st homeschooling piece, um, your time frame might work for you. Um, those other parents, um, it might not. So I'm just trying to make sure that when I hear those questions, not that I'm a board member, but that I'm directing folks to get the source of information. Well, so I'll certainly you can call any of the principals or call me at any time. I mean, I have an open office. I, I meet with folks all the time. So please okay. reach out. Okay. Right. Thank you. Alexis, oh. I saw you on mute. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that as a student who did online learning last year, I'm really, really happy to hear that the meets will be recorded and, um, and just a little bit more flexibility while still maintaining the structure. I think that would have been really, really helpful last year. So it's good to know that that's going to be a thing going forward. Great. Thanks, Alexis. All right. Any other public comment? All right. Um, please, as always, feel free to reach out. Send us e send um, the administrators emails um, and be in communication. Um, that brings us to our first executive session of the evening. Um, and Jamie, did you want just board for that? Just board and myself. Yep. The rest okay. of the administrators can, can go. All right. Do we need a motion to go into executive session? I think we do. Yep. For a student matter. Yep. So moved. Okay. Second. 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 All right. And that's at 7.40 p.m. Okay. Just started. Okay. I would entertain a motion to accept the superintendent's recommendation. I'll move to accept the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a second? Oh, sorry. Second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor of accepting the superintendent's recommendation say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And we have accepted the superintendent's recommendation regarding a student matter. Um, is there a motion to go back into executive session regarding a student matter? I'll make a motion to go into executive session for a student matter. I'll second. second. All right, great. Thank you. And that is at 7.52 PM. All right. So we need to turn off the recording again. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. lower corner, lower corner, sorry. Yep, the three little dots stacked in the lower right-hand corner. So we're out of executive session at 7.57 p.m. Um, I would entertain a motion to accept the superintendent's recommendation related to the student matter. This is Lisa. I, I'll, okay. I'll make that. And would anyone like to second that? I'll second, I'll second it. Who was that? Chris or Bob? Or... Bob. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Great. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor of accepting the superintendent's recommendation related to a student matter, say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? There are none. Thank you. Um, that brings us to our next agenda item, which is other or future agenda items. Um, does anyone have something 
that they would like to add. So we have another executive session? No, nope, those were oh, I thought those were no. Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the one thing I would say is that we in the past have been posting the agendas to the school Facebook page. I was just looking and we haven't been the last couple. And since a lot of the agenda now is or we're kind of getting the reports and writing in advance. Let's make sure when they're posted to the Facebook page that everything's linked in there properly. So I don't know who we need to talk to about that, but. Well, I'll try to work to coordinate with, coordinate that with Christy. Right now, something that's been troubling for me at a system level is that right now, I as the superintendent have no ability to communicate with any of my families without going through the school, which is just crazy to me. So I've been working with Ray to say that the, we have to all pull together within Blackboard Connect so that we have one main way to communicate out, as well as identify SU level personnel like Ray that have ability to get on any of the school Facebook pages. So those are things that are in the works, Andrew. I think once we get those in place, then I can be much more systematic about how I get information out. Like right now, if I was, if there's an emergency, I have no ability as the superintendent to place a call out to my families. Yeah, I just mean that I think we'd put the school Facebook page as one of the posting places mm -hmm. that are being posted. So. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, we'll get that tightened up. But in general, I wanted the board to know I'm not happy with how we're communicating out. There's not a systematic way to it. Okay. I appreciate that you're working on that. I, I think uh, it's going to be – it's just don't forget the homeschool families because there's a number of families that aren't on um, Blackboard that might be being uh, aware of what's happening or school board minutes or announcements on Facebook. But, you know, just we've got to make sure to, to connect to all families that because I think some of the, the homeschool families that might be taking just a few classes here and there have not been included on Blackboard or have had a hard time getting in i don't know I, well, that would just, that's another system we should change if they are taking any courses with us they should be in black right or if they're interested I, I don't know i'm not sure and i don't know if any of you have access to front porch forum but it might not be a bad place to also the board to communicate yeah i've been posting on front porch forum and i forgot to post this latest board meeting but in the past i have been putting it on there and um, I could also remember to put it in the newspaper because that's been recommended as a regular thing too. So I could put it in the calendar as the clock. Yeah, maybe when you post them, put a link to the Google Drive, that folder that has the reports and stuff. Yeah. You know, it does seem like with a lot of the parts of the agenda just being, did you read my report? Good. You know, we yeah. make sure the reports are the public can see the reports too. Mm -hmm. And all those reports are up on the WRVSU website as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I know that just people don't think to go there. I yeah. do love the reports, by the way, and the ability to just kind of speed through those parts of the agenda is great. I think our website has been so cumbersome and so poorly updated in the past that families sort of have trained themselves not to look there anymore, which mm -hmm. is a shame. Um, so Facebook is the place where people have gotten the most timely information. And um, if, if we can redirect with a link to a really dynamic website that has all the information, I think we can get people. That's um, my hope. We're going to try to get there. Yeah, and Apple is actually going to pilot a new a new um, software that seems pretty okay. reasonably priced, and we're going to pilot that through FBUD and see if it's easier to update and that the SU will still have the ability to update as well. Uh, right. That would be easier instead of relying on uh, school personnel to have to do it. Awesome. All right. Any other agenda items or questions before we adjourn for the evening? <coughs> I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay.
All right. Um, all in favor, say aye, and we're adjourned at 8.03. Aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Have a good evening, guys. You too. Bye-bye.